It's a great pleasure to be here. I'll let people sit down. But um, I, have a, I have a series of lectures uh, prepared. And of course, uh, I'm not going to change major material in the next couple of days. But I'm very interested to know uh, a little bit about who's here before I start. And um, what you're expecting to get out of this, and what you'd like to get out of this. And I might be able to adjust a little bit to be able to accomplish that. So first of all, um, raise your hand if you consider yourself a computer scientist. OK, almost everybody. Raise your hand if you're, you don't consider yourself a computer scientist. OK. Um, so what would you characterize yourself? Somebody who says they're not a computer scientist. What kind of field are you in? Anybody? Machine learning. Machine learning. OK, machine learning maybe is not computer. Raise your hand if your uh, background is in statistics or mathematics. OK, a fair number of you. Um, uh, engineering, electrical engineering, a few maybe. Physics. Psychology, neuroscience. That's interesting. So actually, my background, um, I just say a little bit about me. Huh? Maybe come at it from agriculture. Agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> so my background is um, I started out interested in artificial intelligence uh, and, and neuroscience. I studied neuroscience and cognitive science. And then I also did some computer science. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I went and did a PhD in neuroscience. Um, and then sometime in the middle of that, uh, I discovered that machine learning was very interesting. And that it was actually easier to do machine learning if you didn't worry about how the brain works. Um, so over the years, I lost interest in how the brain works. Uh, it's so, still interesting, but I'm not going to spend time worrying about it. And I got more and more interested in um, machine learning and statistical machine learning. So I had to teach myself statistics. So most of what you'll hear in these lectures has something to do with statistics, but I'm not a, I don't have a degree in statistics. So if you have a degree in statistics, I might seem a bit strange to you, the way I describe statistics. OK. Um, now, uh, how many of you have worked in machine learning and used machine learning algorithms? OK, raise your hand if you've used machine learning algorithms. Um, give me examples of things you've used. Let me hear. I want to hear from this side of the room, somebody. This is the majority side. Something you've used. SVMs. SVMs. Trees. Sorry? Decision trees. Decision trees. OK, somebody from this side of the room. Bayesian clustering and stick breaking. Oh, good. Okay. So you you you're not gonna learn very much then. <laughs> okay. I hope I can get some answers Okay, okay. So um, uh, now maybe on a piece of paper, if you have a piece of paper, spend a couple of minutes and just write down kind of things you would be interested in learning about. Okay? So just two minutes. Just if you have a piece of paper, if you don't have a piece of paper, ask your neighbor for a piece of paper. Share the piece of paper with your neighbor. And write down something you'd like to learn uh, that, I, that maybe I might be able to teach you. Something related to machine learning, hopefully. And I'm not promising I will do this, uh, but I'm curious. And I might be able to say something useful. And then in... in um, in two minutes, I'll start the proper lectures. So don't worry. If you want formal lectures, I can do that. Okay. For those of you taking this for credit, this is your, uh, this is your, the hard work you have to put in to get the credit. <laughs> you have to think, what do you really want to learn? Okay.
Okay, you can, you can think about this during the lecture. I'm going to start, but uh, I'd like you, when you're done, just pass the pieces of paper forward, and I'll just collect them here, and I'll look at them later. Okay. Okay, great. So um, uh, this course is on probabilistic modeling and machine learning. And um, apologies for uh, being unable to come here yesterday. We, I genuinely tried, but it ended up being impossible. Uh, and uh, uh, due to circumstances, I couldn't control. So I'm going to try to compress the material into the four remaining lectures. Um, and hopefully have time for some questions. Uh, the first lecture is going to start out at a fairly high level introduction. And then as you'll see over the lectures, I'm going to get more and more um, technical, more and more close to the state of the art in probabilistic machine learning. And obviously more and more focusing on the areas where um, me and my group have been working on. Okay. So let's just start. Um, let's focus on, uh, we're going to spend the first few slides thinking about machine learning and probabilistic modeling. So let's just start. So what's machine learning? Well, the term is relatively new. It comes roughly from the 80s. Uh, but the idea of getting machines to learn is obviously very old. And it goes by many different names depending on what community you're working in which shouldn't really be the case because it's sort of basically solving the same kinds of problems. So um, you'll hear terms like pattern recognition. Uh, back when I started my PhD, what I thought I was interested in was neural networks. Um, there is a whole community working in data mining, which is very closely related. Uh, if you come from an engineering background and you start uh, studying control theory, you want to get uh, controllers that adapt. That's sort of a form of machine learning. Um, if you're doing statistics, um, you might think that this term machine learning is a bit funny because it's just statistical modeling. Um, uh, a very popular term these days is data analytics and data science. Everybody's talking about big data. And when you read, in fact, the last Tuesday's New York Times had a special section on big data. And the opening article on big data said, the term big data might not survive very long, but the basic methods um, underlying it uh, will. Uh, and the last thing it mentions in the article is machine learning. It says, you know, that's what you do. What do you do with big data? Well, you can store it. You can analyze it. You can do data science. In a sense, that's all aspects of uh, machine learning or data mining. Um, when I uh, started uh, getting interested in this as a teenager, what I was really excited about was artificial intelligence. Again, another term that has gone up and down in popularity over the decades. How do we make computers intelligent? The old uh, paradigm was we build a lot of rules. And the new view is, well, maybe we give them a lot of data and we let them learn. So I'm going to use the term machine learning. But even 10 or 15 years ago, I wouldn't have called myself a machine learning researcher. In 10 years, I might call myself something else. OK? So but what is it? Well, um, it's really about learning. OK? So how does a system learn from data and from experience? And this is a topic that's been studied by many different people in many different communities. So in engineering, uh, you know, even things like signal processing, system identification, as I mentioned, adaptive and optimal control, et cetera, are uh, based around systems that learn to some extent. In computer science, it's usually associated with artificial intelligence and applied to problems like computer vision, information retrieval, robotics, etc. In uh, statistics, um, there are uh, different ways of understanding what learning from data means. Uh, things like learning theory, uh, uh, inference, uh, different forms of uh, statistical theory get uh, applied there and also applied statistics. Um, obviously, cognitive scientists and psychologists are interested in understanding systems that learn, particular biological or human systems that learn. And many of the topics in these fields um, relate to learning. Uh, as I mentioned, I studied computational neuroscience, which to some extent is interested in how 
uh, brains and neurons might be able to uh, represent knowledge and learn from uh, experience. And even fields, for example, like economics, which are focused on things like rational decision making, um, games, etc., a lot of those areas of research uh, relate to the problem of learning. Okay? So this is something many different people have studied. Uh, and in many different ways with many different goals, but the really nice thing is that even all of these di divergent fields have sort of converged to uh, some common set of tools that they apply. So the thing that's common to all these fields is the basic mathematical tools that keep getting reused um, by the different communities. And uh, so machine learning as a field is really an interdisciplinary field and it focuses on um, some of the fundamental mathematics of learning, some of the algorithms for getting that mathematics to actually do something, and then some of the applications of that to solving real world problems. <clears throat> and, um, and learning can be uh, interpreted quite broadly, so it's not just passively learning from data, but also systems that interact with their environment uh, and reason and act on their environment in different ways. Okay. So these ideas have uh, come together in this field of machine learning and most people kind of don't really immediately see machine learning in their daily lives okay? because it's not obvious where it appears. But just as an interesting anecdote, um, I visited Facebook uh, about a year ago and they had a machine learning summit at Facebook, just a small meeting and the, the, one of the main guys there get, got up and he said, this is, you know, he showed, this is a, an average Facebook user's uh, profile page. Every component of this has some machine learning behind it, okay? So they don't know, people interact with Facebook, but they don't realize necessarily, but there's a little bit of machine learning behind, obviously, you know, the ads that might get shown, the friendship recommendations, uh, you know, how content is displayed and ordered on the page, etc. And you know, the same story goes for uh, you know, Google and Microsoft, and, but also in a lot of other industries, more and more we're seeing the emergence of machine learning. Uh, one example of that is um, Maybe uh, finance, for example, you know, people want to make money by doing trading and um, you know, trading algorithms have to make decisions very quickly, much more quickly than humans are able to make. So what do you do? Well, you develop some automated piece of software that makes those decisions for you. And uh, the thing behind that often is machine learning. So I'll just zip through a whole bunch of different applications. This is just a random sampling of applications uh, that are more obvious to everybody um, as an application, but that hidden behind it is a lot of machine learning. So automatic speech recognition, machine translation, dialogue systems, modeling of text and text summarization. Uh, these are all applications of machine learning. Um, the field of computer vision uh, has made great advances over the years, and more and more it's becoming dependent on the use of data. Um, to help solve machine uh, computer vision problems. And some of the algorithms behind that are machine learning algorithms. Um, information retrieval. So, you know, if you're a company like Google, you're interested in deciding when somebody types in a query, uh, for example, how do you personalize that query? Um, how do you rank the uh, displayed items to the user? How do you display advertisements, which I haven't shown here, um, et cetera. You know, if you're running something like Gmail, uh, you're interested in email spam detection. That's another classical application of machine learning, um, et cetera. As I mentioned, uh, financial prediction and automated trading is uh, one application area of machine learning. Some of my students end up, you know, if they if they're interested in making money rather than you know, going into academia, then they get sucked into kind of the city of London financial industry or whatever, doing machine learning type things. Um, 
you know, if you're more interested in helping people rather than making money off people, then um, uh, medical diagnosis is an interesting application of machine learning where, um, you know, this is a very old kind of picture of what um, a medical diagnosis machine learning system might look like. You observe some symptoms and you're trying to uh, infer some diseases from those symptoms. But actually more and more what people are talking about is personalized medicine. So if you know something about uh, somebody's medical history and you have an electronic database of patients and the different treatments that, treatments that they've had, and if you correlate that with um, genomic information about them, uh, you can uh, target medicines much more accurately than just giving everybody the same medicine for the same disease. Okay. Um, and a closely related thing is the whole uh, field of bioinformatics, which has become very dependent on high throughput data analysis, uh, ends up using lots of tools from machine learning, and other areas of scientific data analysis, obviously. Uh, anywhere where the amount of data is so large that uh, you can't manually uh, go through it yourself. You need some data analysis methods, and often those methods end up being forms of machine learning or statistical modeling. Now, what's really happened over the you know, past uh, five or ten years is that we've entered a kind of information revolution. And a lot of people argue that this is a little bit like the Industrial Revolution. In the Industrial Revolution, uh, you had coal and the steam engine, and with that, uh, you, know, you could do a lot of things a lot more efficiently than you could before. And nowadays, it seems that one of the things that's happening is we have lots of data. This is like the coal. This is the raw, unprocessed data. And we have algorithms like the steam engine to turn that data into knowledge and decisions and uh, information. Okay. And so, in some sense, that's transformed lots of different things. For example, uh, you know, as we all feel you know, in society, a lot of the ways we interact with people is based around the communication of electronic information that generates data. Uh, governments are very interested in data. There are lots of digital archives of information. Uh, fields of science have been transformed by experiments that um, generate huge amounts of data. Even the scientific literature itself is getting so big that it's hard for somebody to keep track of what's going on without using some automated tools. Um, and lots of businesses have evolved around um, using data um, to benefit consumers. So when you have lots of data, well, what do you need? You need tools for modeling that data, for searching it, visualizing it, and understanding these large data sets. And machine learning is part of that um, set of tools. So let me focus on this concept of modeling tools. So um, what do I mean by modeling tools? Well, um, our modeling tools should somehow be able to uh, represent uncertainty in the model. I'll talk a little bit more about models in a few minutes. Um, and uh, we really want them to be adaptive and automated and robust to all kinds of noise and messiness in the data, and we want them to scale well to large data sets. Um, so the title of this, uh, this lecture was <coughs> Introduction to Probabilistic Modeling and Machine Learning. I tried to give you a very high-level overview of what I think machine learning means. Uh, let me talk to you about probabilistic modeling and, and what I think that term uh, could mean. And then I'll link the two together, because actually, in a lot of my own work, I don't really distinguish between the two. I feel like they, they're both kind of parts of the same thing. So what is probabilistic modeling? Um, so what's a model? A model is some description of data that one could observe from a system. Okay? So, uh, if, if you want to know if the model is good, you have to be able to say, well, is this a good model of this system? And that has to mean something about, are the observables predicted by the model uh, somehow corresponding to the observables you could measure uh, in the system? 
Okay? So models are ways of um, expressing possible observable data from a system. Models can also help us understand something about the system. Right? But now, um, if we use the mathematics of probability theory to express all the forms of uncertainty that and noise that we have in our model, then we can use the same tools of probability theory, which is, you know, sometimes used to be called inverse probability about a hundred years ago. Um, and nowadays it's called Bayesian statistics. Um, so we could use those basic rules of probability theory to infer unknown hidden quantities uh, about our model from the data and to learn the parameters of our model uh, from the data to make predictions, etc. So uh, this is the basic kind of framework that I'm going to think about in terms of modeling. And uh, one of the basic tools that uh, people use in probabilistic modeling is, is uh, Bayes' rule. I've written it in words here. You'll see it a couple more times in the slides. And uh, as a way of thinking about models, Bayes' rule can be expressed very nicely in terms of these words. Okay. So what did I say uh, on this slide? A model describes data that one could observe from a system. Okay? So let's think of a model or a hypothesis as being kind of uh, equivalent words for now. Now we're going to say we're going to use the mathematics of probability theory to express all the forms of uncertainty and noise associated with our model. So what does that mean? Well, that means that our model or hypothesis should make some predictions about possible data you could observe. Okay. So this part is um, kind of the, uh, the expression of what our model represents as a probability distribution over possible data that, it, that could uh, be observed. For example, we might have a model of weather in Roslav, right? And the model should be able to make predictions about, you know, whether it's going to rain or not, you know, for every hour of the day into the future, let's say. And now different people might have different models of the weather in Roslav. Um, and the question is, well, uh, for example, one question might be, which one of these models is a good model? The other question might be, having observed the weather in Rostov for two days, in my case, <laughs> how would I best learn about the weather in, in Rostov? How, what, is the, what should my predictions be for tomorrow, given my observations for the last two days? Um, think about all of these questions. So a model is a distribution over possible data. And now we might have multiple different models, and before we've observed the data, we might be able to um, have uncertainty about the different models that we have. Okay? And the way we're going to express all forms of uncertainty is through probability distributions. So for example, uh, I've only been in Brostov for two days. Uh, some of you have been here much longer than that. You might have a different model for the weather in Rostov. Some of you might be amateur meteorologists, etc. So now, if you're going to reason about the different models that different people propose, you should be able to express the fact that uh, my model is likely to be very bad. Okay? Uh, somebody who's an amateur meteorologist who's lived in Rostov for many years might have a very good model. And the way we express that uncertainty about which one of these models is good or bad is through a probability distribution over the models. And that's what's uh, called the prior here. And we can talk about that a lot more. In fact, we'll talk about that a lot more in this, uh, in this lecture. And then Bayes' rule, which just follows from simple rules of probability theory, tells us that uh, given the data, the, the dis posterior distribution over the hypotheses, or the different models given the data, is just the probability that each of the hypotheses gave to the data that we observed multiplied by the prior and then renormalized. This is a normalization constant such that this thing sums to 1. Okay? 
So uh, Bayes' rule tells us how to do inference about hypotheses from data, and obviously that's very useful not just for meteorology but for any kind of science. And if you view data analysis as a form of uh, science from data, it's obviously useful for that. Okay, so um, let me move on. By the way, it turns out this is the picture everybody uses for Reverend Thomas Bayes. Um, it turns out that uh, this is very likely not <laughs> Thomas Bayes. Um, somebody recently uh, studied it carefully and realized that Thomas Bayes uh, was a nonconformist minister, and a nonconformist minister would not have worn those clothes. So, um, although the prior was uh, for many years that this was Thomas Bayes, uh, some new evidence has emerged to suggest this is not Thomas Bayes. Okay. He was a lady. Sorry? He was a lady. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah, we don't know. We have no, uh, you know, we have no depiction of him. Okay. Um, should I open some windows? Anybody interested? In Either I'm just hot or uh, those lamps in here. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, if you go to a typical machine learning conference, like for example, the ICML conference that was happening, I guess, last week, you'll see lots of different kinds of machine learning. And um, there are different ways of viewing machine learning. So broadly speaking, we can think of two different ways of viewing machine learning, modeling versus a toolbox view. So uh, the view that I'm essentially going to be talking about is this view of machine learning as a way of developing and learning models of data. So you define a space of possible models, uh, then you learn the parameters and, you, and the structure uh, of the models from the data, and then you use that to make predictions and decisions. Uh, however, uh, another very useful view of machine learning I would characterize as a toolbox of methods. So, you know, if you take a machine learning class, they might teach you, okay, this is, this is a random forest, this is a um, support vector machine, this is logistic regression, this is um, a Bayes network. It's a big toolbox of methods. You get a new problem, and then you kind of you can try out different tools and see how well they perform. So the basic idea is you learn um, as many of the tools as as you um, can fit into your head, and then uh, you feed the data into one of many possible methods or tools, and then you choose the methods that have some combination of some theoretical arguments for, for why they're very good. So for example, famous theorists said this has good generalization error bounds, so maybe this is a good method. Um, but also you look at the empirical performance of these methods on validation or test data. Um, and then obviously in the end you make predictions and decisions based on the tools that you have. So this is, uh, this is very useful and I would characterize like you know, the majority of machine learning, maybe uh, 70 or 80 percent of machine learning, certainly probably 90 percent of applied machine learning is in this toolbox view. Okay. Um, but uh, although this is incredibly useful and lots of people um, benefit from it hugely, uh, what I'm going to be trying to argue for is for people to think a little bit in this model-based framework. Okay. So sort of instead of thinking about whole tools that you could use, like I'm going to pull out the SVM software and apply it here, I'm going to pull out this software and apply it here, think about machine learning as a problem of modeling data. And then you have different components that you can use, l small components like different probability distributions, Lego bricks almost. And you build yourself a a probabilistic model of the thing that you're trying to model by combining these Lego bricks. And if it's not good, you can add and subtract Lego bricks from it. And uh, you know, maybe you can even automate the process of adding and subtracting Lego bricks to make it more fully automated than before. Okay. Do you have any questions about this, by the way? Which gives me a chance to open my bottle of water. I will force people to ask questions at a later point, but it's too early now. 
A good strategy, by the way, which I'm going to warn you, is you say, I'm not going to continue until somebody asks a question. <laughs> but I won't use that now. Okay. So, um, so here is the plan. Um, I'm going to try to introduce some of the foundations of probabilistic machine learning. Then I'm going to talk about this problem of intractability and then uh, how to deal with it, some approximation tools, and then some advanced topics, limitations, and discussion. Somewhere in the middle here, we'll have a break um, because three hours is, is a very long time for you to be sitting here and listening to one person and maybe also for me to be speaking. Okay? Um, so let's just start. So this is the high-level plan. This is the more detailed plan, in case you want to know. Um, and you don't really have to know this because I'm going to talk about it. Right? So this, somebody once said, well, what's the point of having an outline slide if you're just going to talk about these things? Okay. So, um, so let's start to think about machine learning by thinking about some very uh, canonical, very um, basic problems that people often solve. Uh, so I'll talk about three of them. Classification, regression, and clustering. Okay? So here is linear classification. So I have some data. My data consists of um, points in some space. For example, the, uh, my X points could live in d-dimensional real space. And class labels, um, the simplest case I can think about is binary classification, call them plus and minus one. Okay? So the picture of that data, when uh, D is two dimensions, looks like this. I have um, the data points in the positive class and the data points in the negative class. And I have a total of n data points here. Okay? Now, um, you know, usually you could say, well, classification, the goal is to do classification. But let's think about it a little bit more as a model. Okay, so what's a model for linear classification? A model for linear classification would say uh, the probability, this is a, a hard linear classifier expressed as a model. Okay. The probability of the nth data point uh, having class uh, plus one given some parameters, which I'll talk about in a minute, and the location of the nth data point is 1 if uh, the nth data point falls on one side of my linear boundary in d dimensions. So this is the expression of uh, a linear half plane in d dimensions. Okay? And 0 otherwise. This is hard binary classification expressed as a model. And the parameters of this model are just the parameters of this classification boundary. There are d plus 1 uh, parameters just because um, you have, uh, you have a, a bias and a linear term here. Okay. So now, uh, what's the goal? Well, the goal is to do classification, right? But the, we can express the goal like this. Our goal is to infer or learn about these parameters theta from the data and to predict future labels of new data points. Okay? Very, very simple. Is everybody happy with this? Raise your hand if you're not happy with this. Okay. Okay, now let's talk about regression. Um, linear regression is boring, so let me talk about polynomial regression, which is a little less boring. Um, so our data set has n data points. Now my data points are pairs of x's and y's. x, for example, could be uh, points on the real. These, the data points are these red dots. And y's are also going to be reals. And my goal is to learn a function that maps from x to y, okay, like that blue function. So again, what's the model? Where, well, the model is a polynomial. In this case, it's an mth order polynomial, which has m plus 1 parameters. But you know, obviously, we don't expect the data to go perfectly through the polynomial. So the model is not 
well defined until we talk a little bit about the possibility of noise in the observations. So the model is that y is an nth order polynomial plus some noise, epsilon, and for example, as a simple case, we could say, let's assume that epsilon is uh, normally distributed with zero mean and variance sigma squared. Okay? So now our parameters are uh, m plus two parameters, the coefficients of my polynomial and the noise standard deviation sigma. Okay. Of course, the whole point of modeling is the moment I write down a model and express it like this, you can say, I don't like that model. I, I would prefer a different model. And you could try a different model. It's like the, the Lego bricks or components that you can use. You could say, um, Gaussian noise doesn't seem right for this problem. Let me try t-distributed noise or something like that. Or polynomials is not the right expansion. Let's expand in terms of sinusoids or something like that. Okay? But we have to st start with describing a model, and this is just an example. So we have a key components, data, model, parameters, and our goal is to infer the parameters data from the data so as to predict future outputs new y's given the observed data, uh, x, and our assumptions about the model. Okay, that's polynomial regression. So now let's talk about clustering. Actually, this is, we can think of this both as clustering and as density estimation. So here is clustering with a Gaussian mixture model. Um, and we can also think about this as a way of uh, flexibly learning the density of the data. Now our data is uh, points, endpoints in some RD, and we don't have any labels. So we just have input points, x's. These are these little blue dots in the picture. Our model for this Gaussian mixture model uh, consists of the following. It says, um, my data point x comes from a mixture of m components where uh, pi i represents the fraction of the data captured by each component. It's one of the parameters of my model. And pi of x represents the density of that component. So in a Gaussian mixture component with m components, these pi's would be uh, Gaussian densities. Uh, with their own individual mean, mu i, so that's the, the center of this um, uh, ellipse, and covariance matrix sigma i represented by the actual shape of the ellipse. So this is a picture of something like 200 data points and uh, m equals 6 clusters, and the clusters are Gaussians with different covariance matrices. So that's our model. And what are our parameters? Our parameters are uh, the means and the covariance matrices of each of my Gaussians and the vector of m uh, numbers here, which are these mixing proportions that sum to 1. Okay, Everybody happy with that? Um, so the goal now is to infer parameters data from the data that can be used to predict the density at a new location. You could say, what is the probability of observing data uh, where my finger is here, right? What is the probability density where my finger is? Or what is the probability in this little region here? Um, and we might also want to infer which points belong to the same cluster. Like, for example, if these are genes and we're doing clustering of genes, the question might be, uh, do, these, do these two genes belong to the same cluster of genes or not? What is the probability of that? Okay. Okay, so how many people here um, have studied the EM algorithm for Gaussian mixture models? Raise your hand if you have studied that. Okay. Good. Not very many people. Uh, how many people have studied support vector machines? Okay, a few more people than that. Okay. Uh, how many people have no idea what I'm talking about when I say EM algorithm for Gaussian mixture model? A few people. It's okay. All right. Good. 
Okay, so, but the basic idea is the following. The basic idea is we always have um, some components in our machine learning problem. We always have to have data. Otherwise, you know, how do you do learning? Okay? And then uh, there is some method or model. And model based machine learning, the model is represented as some probability distribution over aspects of the data. That model tends to have some parameters. And we usually have a goal in mind. We're usually interested in something in particular, like clustering or regression or classification and so on. So we can write down a model like this. And then we can say, OK, well, I want to learn these parameters from data. So let me um, figure out an algorithm that will learn these parameters from the data. OK. All right. So the nice thing about basically everything I'm going to talk about in this, uh, this week of lectures is that um, it all follows from two simple rules. Okay? So you don't have to fill your brain up with too many things. Okay? You, you're welcome to fill it up with everything else I'm going to talk about. But you should at least stick these two rules somewhere in your head. And everybody probably knows these two rules if they've studied probability theory at some point. But maybe what you haven't thought about is how much we can do just with these two rules. And in fact, I would argue that everything in Bayesian machine learning just comes down to different applications of these two rules, which makes it maybe boring, but also makes it very exciting that so much can be done with some simple stuff. Um, so these are the two rules. These are rules, basic rules of probability theory. There's a sum rule and a product rule. The sum rule says that the probability distribution over some variable x can be written as the sum over some other variable y of the joint probability of x and y. Okay? Now, if you don't like, uh, if y is continuous, uh, then you can replace that sum with an integral. If you don't like integrals, you can always think about those integrals as sums, unless you're a mathematician and you worry about these things. Okay? So that's the sum rule. The product rule says that the joint probability of x and y factors into the probability of x times the probability of y given x. That's what the vertical bar means. Or alternatively, the probability of x times the probability, sorry, the probability of y times the probability of x given y. All right? Um, so the joint probability of rain in Vroslav and Krakow would be factored into the probability of rain in Vroslav times the probability of rain in Krakow given rain in Vroslav, or the other way around on any pair of days. Okay? So uh, from the sum rule and the product rule, we get Bayes' rule, which you've already seen before. And here, I've just rewritten Bayes' rule in a slightly different notation. Instead of using x's and y's, I've written it in terms of thetas and d's. And I've conditioned everything on a model assumption m. Okay, so everything here is conditioned on m. That's valid. I can always condition on m everything. m just means some model or background assumptions. Okay? So, um, so what does this say now? This says, uh, this says learning is the following, okay, from a Bayesian modeling point of view. Before I observe the data, I need to express my uncertainty about my model parameters. Okay? And I've said that the basic rule is use the language of probability theory to express uncertainty. In just the same way as we use calculus to express rates of change, Probability theory is the mathematical language for expressing uncertainty. Okay? So we are uncertain about the parameters of our model before observing data. So we're going to use a prior distribution, a distribution over the parameters of our model theta. And different people might have different priors, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. And the other way to think about priors is um, 
their way of expressing reasonable ranges of parameter values. Okay, so imagine I'm talking about a linear regression model. Okay, so you know here is a, a linear regression, uh, y given x. Now this linear regression has uh, parameters a and b, okay, which are the you know intercept and slope. So B is the intercept, and A tells you something about the slope here. And if I say A is between uh, minus 1 and plus 1, that's very, very different than if I say A is between minus 100 and plus 100. OK? Those are two different models. So I can't, so linear regression is not a model because you haven't told me what the ranges of your parameters are. You can't generate data from a linear regression model because um, you don't know what ranges to use for these parameters. When I tell you what ranges you can use and when I tell you the probability distribution over those ranges, it could be a soft range. You could say A is just normal with zero mean and unit variance. At that point, then I could actually generate data from the model. And then it becomes a full model. Okay? It's a bit like you know, if you're going to build a car, you know, the car isn't just the engines or the wheel or the windscreen or the seat. You have to have all the components in there, and then you can call it a car. Okay, then, it, you know, the EU can certify it as a car and it can go on the road. Well, I'm not going to certify a model as a model unless it can generate data. Okay? So, the prior is a way of representing the ranges of the parameters. And then for every setting of the parameters, my model is going to be able to assign a probability to some observable data. This, is, this term is called the likelihood. Sometimes people call it the likelihood of the data, but really technically it should be called likelihood of the parameters. It's a function of the parameters. And then um, the sum rule and the product rule tell us that to compute the posterior distribution of the parameters given the data and the model, I multiply the prior times the likelihood, and I renormalize. And this normalization constant is itself quite interesting. It's called the marginal likelihood. Yes, question. Uh, is it sufficient if we uh, talk about uh, the left side being proportional to the right side and ignore the uh, normalization? Um, that's a good question. Uh, a yes in many cases, but sometimes the normalization is essential. Okay? So it depends on your use of the model. For example, if you're trying to um, come up with relative probabilities of different thetas, then you don't need the normalization constant because it's the same. But if you're trying to compare different models, different model classes, M and M prime, then the normalization constant is the only thing you need, actually. So sometimes it's essential and sometimes it's totally unimportant. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So now um, if we, and this is learning. I went from the prior to the posterior. I learned from the data. Okay. Now I want to make predictions. I want to predict what's, I hope it's sunny tomorrow. I want to predict what's the weather tomorrow. Okay, given the data that I've observed in my model. And um, the, I shouldn't come up with a, some algorithm for prediction. I should just go back to my two rules. Okay, my two rules, the sum rule and the product rule, say that, well, uh, I'm going to just write that out maybe a little bit more slowly. Uh, so P of x given D and M, right? By the uh, sum rule, I can write that as the integral of p of x and theta given d and m. All right, I've just added in, this is integral d theta. Sorry if you can't see that. I've just added in theta and integrated it out. That's the sum. That's by the sum rule. Okay. Now by the product rule, 
I can take this term and write it as P of X given theta D and M. And I can take the other term and write it P of theta given D and M. D theta. That's a multiplication there. That's just the application of the product rule. But now I have something very interesting. I have this sort of expression on the, on the slide here. What the expression on the slide says is to make a prediction given the data, I should average the predictions for all thetas weighted by their posteriors, by the posterior probability of each theta. Okay? So, uh, so there is a, a natural, the sum rule and the product rule give you a natural way of doing ensembling of models. Okay, you're averaging the predictions of these models weighted by the posterior probability. That's this term in green. And notice that um, probability theory has no maximized rule. Okay. There isn't any rule that said, uh, this is the likelihood. I should find the maximum likelihood parameter values by optimizing this thing to fit the data. Now, optimization is very useful, and I encourage everybody to know lots about optimization. But it doesn't appear anywhere on this slide. Okay, it's not a foundation for uh, Bayesian modeling. It's useful in decision theory after you've built your model. Maybe if you want to decide, should I go left or right or something like that? Should I classify it as plus or minus 1 in the end, given some loss function? OK, so that's prediction. And now model comparison uh, is if I'm trying to compare different models. Um, let's say I'm comparing model M and model M prime. Well, I can have a posterior distribution over different models, m. For example, posterior distribution over orders of my polynomial or number of clusters in my clustering model. And that's just an application of sum rule and product rule at the level of um, the, the entire data set averaging out the parameters theta. So that's just Bayes' rule here. And now this term in red, which appeared here, here, and here, this is the normalization constant, which sometimes we could ignore. But here it's essential, because it tells us what is the probability of the data under this whole model class. And that probability, by the sum rule and product rule, is the average of the likelihood averaged with respect to the prior. So this term here is called sometimes the marginal likelihood, sometimes the um, Occam's sort of, uh, uh, I'll mention Occam's razor in a minute, is related to this, sometimes called the model evidence, sometimes called the integrated likelihood. It has a bunch of different names. Okay. So any questions about that? That's it. Okay. So that's it for the week. And uh, you know, <laughs> we can all go and relax and enjoy the weather for the rest of the week. <laughs> OK, no, it's not totally it, right? I mean, that's just the basic foundations in one slide of this probabilistic approach to modeling. But obviously, to actually apply it to anything, you need to know the different Lego bricks that you can use. You need to know uh, how do you do these integrals in practice. Uh, and there are lots of other things uh, that are involved in trying to understand um, this approach to probabilistic modeling. OK. So, uh, so here are some questions that might be interesting and I'll talk about. So this lecture focuses mostly on the foundations and then talks about algorithmics a bit later. So um, one question of interest is what motivates this Bayesian framework? Um, where does the prior come from? A lot of people um, are interested in, in knowing the answer to that. And how do we do these integrals that appeared on the previous slide? right? So let's focus on these. So what motivates this Bayesian framework? Um, so there are several ways of motivating it. So here is one way of thinking about it, not for somebody who came into this field from statistics, but for somebody like myself who was originally interested in 
artificial intelligence, building intelligence systems. Okay? So if you want to build um, some sort of artificial intelligence system, like a robot, you might want it to uh, have representations of its beliefs about the world. Okay? So for example, if a robot is navigating in a room, it should have beliefs about where the door is and whether that's a door or a window and whether that's a door or a window. And those beliefs are obviously useful because otherwise the robot might walk out the window instead of walking out the door. Right? So how does the robot represent uh, beliefs about propositions in the world? Well, uh, you know, you could think about just using purely logic. Uh, you know, that's a window, that's a door. That would be great if you get it right. But what we want to represent is strength of belief. Okay, so what is a numerical representation of strength of belief in the brain of this robot? And we want to know what mathematical rules we should use to manipulate this concept of strength of belief. Okay? So now we're not really even talking about machine learning or statistics. We're talking about kind of representing belief. So here is the really interesting um, uh, work that came from the 1940s. Uh, sometimes these are called the Cox axioms or the Cox-Janes axioms. Actually, there's a really nice book by uh, Van Horn in 2003 that describes this very well. And the basic idea is the following. I won't go into it in great detail because you know, it takes about a chapter of James's book to describe the, how to prove this. Okay? And then somebody found a little problem in the proof, and then you know, people fix it up later. Okay. But here is the basic idea. We want to use uh, some symbols, like let's say b of x, to represent the strength of belief or plausibility of proposition x. So what is the belief that that's a door? Okay. Now, uh, we want to make b of x be a real number between 0 and 1, where b of x equals 0 means definitely, I believe this is definitely not true. b of x equals 1 means I believe this is definitely true. And then b of x given y with this vertical bar, you can see where I'm going already, uh, means what is the strength of belief that x is true given that we know that y is true. Like given that somebody tells me this is a door, then what is the strength of belief that that thing right next to it is a door? Which is very strange. I wonder if they go to different rooms actually. Um, they could have made a bigger door maybe. Okay. So um, here is uh, the basics. And now what the Cox axioms say is uh, we want the strengths of beliefs to follow some basic rules of common strength. We want the strength of beliefs, or called, you could call it degree of plausibility, to be represented by real numbers. We want them to qualitatively correspond with common sense. Um, you know, and there's a few examples of what we mean by that. And we want them to be consistent in certain ways. So the ways in which we want them to be consistent are the following. If a conclusion can be reasoned in several ways, then each way should lead to the same answer. Okay? So, for example, if I'm conditioning my beliefs on uh, the fact that that's a door and that's a window, and I want to know whether that's a door, it should be the same whether I uh, order my computations by computing first that that's a window, then that's a door, and then computing that, and the other way around. Okay? Um, the other thing is that the rules by man of, for manipulating beliefs must take into account all relevant evidence. So they can't arbitrarily throw away information. They can't sort of say, I'm going to arbitrarily flip a coin and decide to throw away the fact that I know that that's a window. That's not valid, basically. You need to condition on all the available evidence. And the other thing is that equivalent states of knowledge should be represented by equivalent plausibility assignments. So if b of x equals 0.7, then uh, you know, it can't be that equivalent knowledge could co sometimes come up with b of x equals 0.7 and sometimes with b of x equals 0.9. It always has to come up with the same numbers if they're truly equivalent. 
So the consequence of these Cox axioms is that this funny function, this belief function, needs to satisfy the basic rules of probability theory. So basically, uh, the sum rule and the product rule follow from the Cox axioms, and therefore Bayes' rule follows from the Cox axioms. Okay? So that's interesting. So, uh, so probability theory is also, it's not just the um, mathematics of frequencies, it's also the mathematics of beliefs in some way. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, so that's just one motivation. Uh, here's another motivation for people who might be more interested in gambling or economics um, or decision theory. And this is called the Dutch Book Theorem. I think this was actually discussed by Definiti in the 1930s. And the Dutch Book Theorem says the following. Assume, so what does, what does belief mean anyway? Okay, so what does belief of 0.7 mean anyway? We need to calibrate those beliefs somehow. And the way an economist might think about calibrating beliefs is by thinking about betting. Okay? So uh, assume you're willing to accept bets with odds proportional to the strength of your beliefs. So for example, if your belief um, is uh, 0.9 that something is true, then that should mean that you would be willing to accept a bet where you're going to win, you know, anything more than one dollar if x is true and lose nine dollars if x is false. Okay, that's just one way of setting it up. So if, so if I think something is true, uh, my belief is that it's true with belief function 0.9, then I should accept a bet where if it's true, I win two, and if it's false, I lose nine. Okay, that's one way of telling what somebody's beliefs are. Uh, now, uh, if you're willing to accept bets, then it turns out that unless your beliefs satisfy the sum rule and the product rule, then there exists a set of simultaneous bets that you're willing to accept such that you are guaranteed to lose money no matter what the outcome. Okay. Um, so a good example of this is, you know, if you can't believe, let's say you're, you're betting on the, a football game, you know, you can't believe on a game A playing B, you can't believe that A wins uh, with belief 0.7 and that B wins with belief 0.7, okay? If A is playing B, uh, your belief that A wins 0.7 should go with B winning 0.3, okay? Or, assuming there's no draws, right? That's a very basic form of uh, satisfying the rules of probability theory. But a more complicated setting is, um, is, is harder to reason about. There can be complicated arbitrage. If there are you know, 10 different things that you're trying to bet about, then it's hard to keep in mind um, how to place your bets. And what this says is nothing to do with whether you're good at, at having beliefs or whether your beliefs are true. This is just a statement about whether your beliefs are self-coherent, consistent with, each other, with themselves. If they're not self-coherent, then there is a Dutch book. You're guaranteed to lose money. The only way to guard against Dutch books is to ensure that your beliefs are coherent. In other words, they satisfy the rules of probability theory. So this is kind of also an argument that people have used in um, behavior, uh, like you know, animal behavior, to, to try to reason about animals and their, their representations of probabilities and, and decisions and so on. Okay. Um, so here are some other uh, more theoretical ways of thinking about um, uh, beliefs and this kind of uh, probabilistic modeling or Bayesian framework. So assume that you have a data set D sub n consisting of n data points. And we're going to now think more like statisticians. We're going to say, what's going to happen um, as you observe more and more data? So assume uh, that this was generated from some true parameter values theta star. There's some parameter values theta star out there generated the data. Then under some regularity conditions, which I'm not going to talk about, 
as long as uh, your prior puts some density at theta star and maybe some mass, actually, you need to put maybe a little bit of mass around theta star, okay, in a little epsilon ball around theta star. If your prior puts some mass around theta star, then in the limit, as n goes to infinity, your posterior will converge to a delta function on theta star, okay? So what does this actually mean? Well, what this means is um, if you're going to observe a lot of data, then as long as you, uh, you don't uh, assume that theta star was impossible a priori, if you assume theta star was impossible a priori, like if you say, oh, you know, it's impossible that um, there's a famous article actually in Science or something with the title, Is the Pope an Alien? Okay, this was a, an article from a decade or so ago about Bayesian statistics. All right. So if you assume that it's impossible that the Pope is an alien, then no matter how much evidence you observe, you're still going to assume it's impossible that the Pope is an alien. Okay? So um, as long as you're not dogmatic and you uh, put some probability mass on uh, around every hypothesis in the space, then with enough data, your posterior is going to converge to a delta function on the true theta star. And there are some regularity conditions. This only holds in finite dimensional parameter spaces, and the model needs to be identifiable, so there can't be multiple parameters that are equivalent, etc. Okay, but I'm not talking about those. Now, in the unrealizable case, where data was generated from some other distribution p star of x, which cannot be modeled by any theta in the space that I'm considering, then the posterior will converge to some delta function on some theta hat, where theta hat minimizes the kullback liebler divergence, which I've written here, in case you don't know what that is. It's a measure of the distance between uh, the true distribution p star of x and p of x given theta. And this is just a fancy way of saying that um, the posterior converges to a delta function on the maximum likelihood setting of theta. So if you're worried about priors, then at least your worries should go away as you observe more and more data. As long as you're not dogmatic, and you make sure you put some probability mass everywhere. So this is a good reason why you should consider um, flexible models. <coughs> okay, questions about this? So here is another um, interesting uh, kind of argument for why you know one shouldn't worry too much about priors. This is the idea of asymptotic consensus. So consensus in the sense of agreement. So consider two Bayesians with different priors, P1 of theta and P2 of theta. And now these two Bayesians observe the same data D. And we're going to ask ourselves um, what's going to happen as we get more and more data. So assume both Bayesians agree on the set of possible and impossible values of theta. So this is quite important. Again, this is about not just about um, dog, be one of them being dogmatic, but if one of them is dogmatic about some set of theta, so it says that these thetas are impossible and only these thetas are possible, then the other Bayesian should agree at least on the set that is possible. Okay. So this expression here is just that the set of theta is such that the first Bayesian puts uh, non-zero probability on is the same set as the one that the second Bayesian puts non-zero probability on. Then if that's the case, then in the limit, the two posteriors, um, P1 of theta and P2 of theta, will converge to the same thing. Okay. And so now we can do an exercise and actually work this out. Okay? 
Everybody ready for an exercise? No, not physical exercise. <laughs> it's too hot for physical exercise. Oh. All right, so here is the exercise. So here is a simple probabilistic calculation. Um, appropriately, consider a binary variable. We could call it rain or no rain, or we could call it heads or tails for a coin toss. Okay. Um, and we're going to represent that binary variable as uh, 0, 1. Um, so 0 is tails and 1 is head. Okay. Now, let's model uh, observations D is the set of observations Xn, uh, N going from 1 to big N. So we have N, big N coin tosses using a Bernoulli distribution. So here's just the representation of a Bernoulli distribution. It says, basically what it says is the probability that xn equals uh, 1 is q. That's the probability of heads. Um, the probability that xn equals 0 is 1 minus q. That's just the way of writing down that distribution. Where q is some parameter between 0 and 1. Is this the probability of heads or tails? Okay. Or rain or no rain. Okay. Bef this is before we do the exercise. So first of all, is this a sensible model? So somebody, somebody on this side of the room. I won't continue until somebody says something. <laughs> Yep. Uh, I have uh, a question here about uh, basically. I think I think I misunderstood something here. Uh, so um, we have a binary variable, right? And that's uh, that there is rain or no rain, or that there is heads or tails on a coin flip. Oh no! Sorry, sorry. That's confusing. Yes. Um, there's a two examples. Okay. You know, let's just consider heads or tails. For simplicity. Okay, so the binary variable is. So the model for me looks uh, sensible for the heads or tails case, but not sensible for the rain or no rain case. Okay, excellent answer. Why? Uh, because uh, for heads and or tails, it actually uh, has. Uh, assuming the coin is fair, right? Because mm -hmm. that's not. Uh, but it's, I think it's a reasonable distribution. It's a, just a half by half chance. But with the rain, there are many more different um, circumstances that we should consider in a model and not just uh, whether it is or is not raining. OK, but I'm, I'm assuming that the only thing we observe is whether it rains or doesn't rain. So somebody just tells me, let's say I have a. Um, you know, daily weather for Vroslav for a year. And basically, the only thing that was recorded was whether it, it rained in the, in the town hall at noon or not. OK, just to be precise. So we should also include the probability how often it rains, because it's, it's not that 50-50%. OK, so Q is a parameter in the model. I haven't described what Q is yet, except that I've said it's somewhere between 0 and 1. And Q represents um, the probability of rain for the rain case, or Q represents the probability of heads in the coin case. Yeah, Q would be uh, a constant for the coin case, but there are other things to consider uh, for the value of Q in the rain case. Right. Um, OK. So anybody on this side of the room want to? Add anything to that? I think that's a very good, it's a very good discussion. Isn't this distribution overly concentrated? Model rain or no rain behavior? Okay, the, is the distribution overly concentrated? Well, it's uh, if um, we haven't said what Q is, right? Q is somewhere between zero and one, right? If Q is 0.5, then the distribution is um, is uh, you know, uniform over all binary sequences, right? 
that's not overly concentrated, one could argue. Maybe that's overly unconcentrated, actually. So it all depends on Q. If Q is 0.99, then that you know, puts a lot of probability mass close to one end than the other. But we don't know what Q is yet. So any other comments? For a Bernoulli variable, how many different distributions can we define over, the Bernoulli, vari over Bernoulli variable? Did some one? And what's it called? The Bernoulli, yeah. Yeah. Okay. To be more to be uh, I gave away the answer. For a binary for just a single binary variable, the only distribution we can talk about is the Bernoulli distribution. Okay, a single binary variable. Okay, let me just draw a picture here. A single binary variable um, can take on values zero and one. It has only, there's only one possible parameter for a single binary variable. We could say it's the probability of observing um, a 1. Because if I know the probability of observing a 1, then I know that the probability of observing a 0 is 1 minus q. Okay? Now I can re-parameterize this. I can parameterize it in terms of log of q divided by 1 minus q. But there's only one degree of freedom for a binary variable. So, um, to answer the second question, do we have any other choices? Well, if we assume, and this is where I think you know, one of the points you were making was very interesting, if we assume that the x's are independent given, um, given q, then there is no other choice. The only distribution we can use is the Bernoulli distribution. Okay. Now, in the case of weather, rain is not independent from one day to the next. So that's probably not a good model. You know, maybe it rains more in the spring and less in the, I don't know, some other time of year. Right? OK. So, um, so here is the basic model. Um, now, let's uh, learn this model. Um, Let's learn the parameter q. We, to learn the parameter q from data, we need to start with a prior and condition on the observed data. Let's, for simplicity, let's start with a uniform prior. Okay, so what does a uniform prior look like? Right, obviously. My parameter q is between 0 and 1. And this is what a uniform prior looks like. Pre of q equals 1 between 0 and 1. OK. So here is the exercise. Uh, assume a uniform prior. What is the posterior distribution after observing x1 equals 1? Okay, so take a piece of paper out if you want. And I give you two or three minutes to do this. Um, I think it's important to do this because we need to really figure out what's going on. And otherwise, most of what I'll talk about for the rest of the week won't make much sense. Okay. What is the posterior after x1 equals 1? What do I mean by that? I mean, what is the posterior distribution over q after observing a data set consisting of one observation which said x1 equals 1? So this was the prior, 
And now here we're going to draw the posterior. Okay, anybody have the answer? Raise your hand if you think you have the answer. Very shy people. Raise your hand if you don't think you have the answer. Okay. All right, somebody who thinks they have the answer. Remember, everything follows from the sum rule and the product rule, and maybe understanding the words that I'm saying, that probably is useful. And then there is no magic anywhere. OK, let's work it out. Shall we work it out? All right. So, okay, so we want to know the posterior of Q given x1 equals 1. And what do I know? I know, I know this, which is the likelihood. And I know this, which is the prior. All right, so let's uh, let's follow the, our our rules here. Um, this thing I can write as uh, I can write via Bayes' rule as the prior on Q times the likelihood uh, divided by some normalizing constant. I'm going to call the normalizing constant Z. OK? That's the posterior is the prior times the likelihood. Now, uh, the prior, I said, was 1. Um, but you know, there, is a, there is a sort of a condition on that, that q has to be between 0 and 1. Sorry, you can't see that. But what that says is, that's an indicator function that says q is between 0 and 1. Uh, and the prior is 1, OK? Now the likelihood, what's the likelihood here? Q, Q. OK? Because you know, we've observed x1 equals 1, so the likelihood is Q. Uh, so what does that function look like? It goes between 0 and 1. And Uh, it looks like as a function of q, and it goes up like this. It's a, it's a line. Now here is the trick question. What is the, the slope of the line? Who says 1? 2. Who says 2? OK. Why is it 2? Yes. So this normalizing constant, it turns out, is um, one half, because that's the number you need to put in the denominator here, so that the area here is the same as the area here. Okay. So this function now goes from uh, zero to two, and the posterior is equal to two q. It's two q with an indicator function that says q has to be between 0 and 1. OK, so you know, we can leave that out. We, we all know q is between 0 and 1. The posterior is 2q. All right? Now, this is interesting. We can already start thinking about this. This means if my prior was uniform, I observe one rainy day, my posterior looks like this. Uh, my posterior is a normalized version of my likelihood function. Remember, maximum likelihood? Well, maximum likelihood finds the parameter q that maximizes my likelihood function. If I observe a rain, one single rainy day, what is the parameter that maximizes that likelihood function? q equals 1. So if I were to believe the answers of maximum likelihood, one rainy day if that's the only thing I've observed, would mean that I would have complete certainty that it will rain forever in Bruslav, right? 
okay, which is very sad. Um, but if I start with a uniform prior and I observe one rainy day, if I now want to make predictions, what do I have to do? Okay, to wake up my laptop. This is also a good sign that maybe we should take a break very soon. Okay, if I had to make predictions um, on what's going to happen on the second day, what would I do now? So this is the second part of the question. It's not on the slide. So here is a, a way of expressing that question um, mathematically. So uh, I'm going to make a prediction. My prediction is what is the probability of a over x2 given that I observed x1 equals 1. So you can work that out yourselves. Or we can look at the picture. It turns out from this picture the prediction is going to be sort of actually the average, the expected value of q ends up being the prediction here if you work through the math. And the expected value of q under this triangle, this triangular distribution is uh, at the value, sorry, at this value two-thirds. Okay? So if I observe one rainy day, if I started from a uniform prior, my probability that the second day is rainy is two-thirds. If I started with a different prior, my probability would be different, obviously. Maybe a little bit different. Okay. And now let me basically go back to, remember asymptotic consensus? I have two different Bayesians with two different beliefs, but they're going to observe the same sequence of uh, data. So what happens there? So let's actually try to do a demo. Um, Okay, so <clears throat> okay, so here is a demo. I'm going to have two learners, two people learning about, you know, the coin tosses or the weather in Ruslov or whatever. Learner A is going to have a uniform prior. Learner B is going to have a different prior that's more centered around 0.5. Okay. And now they're going to observe the same data, heads and tails. Okay? So this is the prior. This is condition on data, but there's no data yet. So they observe the first data point. Okay. The first data point is a head, and we get exactly that distribution that, that we saw here. So learner A's posterior over Q ends up looking like this triangle distribution. Learner B's posterior over Q shifts a little bit in the positive direction. Yes? It turns out it is, yes. But the picture, yeah, it, it's not obvious from the picture. It could be something else, but it is a beta prior. So here's something interesting. I've observed uh, one head, all right? So uh, both learners now agree that Q equals zero has zero probability density. Okay? Because I've observed one head, that has to have zero probability density here. Um, but the shapes look very different. So let's observe some more heads and tails. So now I observe another one. Now I observe a tail. I've observed one head and one tail. This guy shifted this uh, to the right and then back to the left. This guy became a triangle, and now what is this distribution? What is, what, what is that distribution here? Forget about the normalizing constant, but can you give me the expression for that distribution? It's a, I'll give you a hint. Sorry? Binomial curve, so somebody else say something, it's very, something very simple. It's a, yeah, it's a quadratic, it's q times 1 minus q with the normalizing constant. Uh, q times 1 minus q or, uh, you know, q 
q minus q squared with a normalizing constant in front. So this is actually literally a quadratic bowl, okay, with, with uh, curvature negative 1. Okay? So that's two coin tosses. Let's keep going. Another head, another head, another head. Okay, so now it's a good number of heads and just one tail. These are what the two distributions look like. But now if we keep going, heads, tails, head, tail, 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 head, tail. So what's happening now? Yeah. So they started very different, right? Just to ignore that the plots are getting rescaled here, so that's why they look different sizes. They started very different, but now after, you know, some number of coin tosses, they're very, very similar, right? Okay? That's the basic idea behind asymptotic consensus. Both of these um, learners uh, observe the same data, their um, beliefs become quite similar. Okay, maybe we should take, uh, should we take a 10 minute break now? Mm -hmm.